well it is my pleasure to introduce the chairperson and co-chair of today's session professor purnanand p savoykar is the chair of this session he completed his b and me from goa engineering college and phd from iit bombay presently he is a professor in the department of civil engineering goa engineering college india his research interests are geotechnical earthquake engineering alternate materials and steel structures he has published several papers in journals and conferences welcome you sir thank you co chair of the session dr vikas kumar he is presently a faculty in civil engineering department at central university of haryana and his research areas are soil stabilization and artificial intelligence and he has published uh, more than 10 papers in journals as well as in the conferences welcome dr vikas thank you sir thank you very much and i am uh, very honored to be a part of this conference thank you now i hand over the session to the chairperson and co-chair for taking over further please yeah, thank you very much rival sir and the organizers for giving me an opportunity uh, to chair this session wherein we have a very interesting presentations by shubhamoy bhattacharya from university of sare and followed by uh, two special lectures by uh, dr satyanarayan reddy and sumanta halder so it's my pride and privilege to introduce the uh, soap speaker subhamay bhattacharya uh, bhattacharya ji holds a chair in geomechanics at university of sare since october 2012 and is visiting fellow at university of bristol he earned his doctorate from university of cambridge on topic investigating failure mechanism of piles in seismically liquefiable soils uh, previously he was working as a senior lecturer in dynamics at university of bristol department lecturer in engineering science at university of oxford junior research fellow at somerville college university of oxford college lecturer at uh, bresen college and lady margaret hall university of oxford has published several papers over 390 papers in various national and international journals and conference proceedings it's our pride to have you shubhamay ji here on this platform the stage is yours and as uh, told by organizers the lecture time is 30 minutes followed by 5 minutes question answer session uh, thank you for the invitation for uh, to present in this conference <clears throat> the what what i will uh, present is something new is uh, something what we are looking forward to so effectively uh, challenges in the design and construction of offshore wind turbine foundation in seismic areas this what i have done in collaboration with sort of my colleague uh, from different universities and different countries and they are given here the names are given here and also in the uh, paper as well so so what is the uh, content of this talk the first content is basically what is the context so why we want to do wind turbine So effectively, all the governments are aiming towards net zero. That means they will not contribute to add carbon to the environment that is causing global warming. And one thing is important is the wind power and the future energy system. So how will the uh, future energy looks like? So currently, we norm we mostly use fossil fuel. So we're burning coal, burning oil, burning gas, and that. not only add to global warming but also health problems they do, do with the uh, breathing and, and other particles in the atmosphere so I'll briefly uh, put this that context because it is a very new area new field then i will talk about the challenges in the, in the design of foundations and and give them a, give some example analysis so first is so we are entering the third c of the triple c crisis so first c was the credit crisis so if you remember in uh, 2008 there was a uh, credit crisis the whole 
financial meltdown. The whole world had to pay for all the brunt of this thing. And the next big one was COVID, which we are going through still. The whole world is shut down mostly. We're trying to emerge. And third one is the climate that is coming. And this climate crisis will be even bigger than this to combine. What is the reason? The, the reason is that we had decades of industrial revolution, which was funded or which was possible, which was powered by the fossil fuel. So we explored oil and gas, we burnt it uh, however we wanted it, and that caused all the development, all these things. But now we have to move down to the uh, sustainable revolution. We have to have a something that is sustainable, that will not uh, make the world uh, unable to live in most parts. That's the concept. Now, what can engineers do? So we can decarbonize the energy system. So there, there are so many, because we, the modern economy runs the energy. So whatever you do, now, for example, I am talking, we use energy. Now, can we use these systems to decarbonize? Can we use energy which are decarbonized? So one of the important energy uh, systems that is completely green is offshore wind. Because wind is renewable, wind is always there. And if you can use a wind to generate power, that would be excellent. So this is a, one of the systems that can be used. So that's the main context of this talk. Wind energy is not new. So wind energy has been used for centuries for selling shit, sawing wood, grinding grains, and many more. It is the oldest source of machine, uh, machine power. And this helped certain countries to basically become a power, uh, uh, big power. Because, and in those days, whoever can make a large number of ships or large boats are most powerful because they could explore the whole world. So, so Holland, they could produce uh, cut wood, saw wood using wind power, and that made them one of the pioneers of, of the industrial revolution. They could, uh, they could automate. So they are the first country. So again, wind is nothing new. And it is becoming a big industry, one trillion dollar industry by 2040, even more. So why is it sustainable? Because wind will blow as long as the sun is shining, because it is sun that hits the land and water differentially, and that differential <clears throat> creates a change of pressure, and that drives the wind. So wind will be always there as long as we have a solar system. The wind will be there, and the figure on the right side shows a graph. And this shows, this is a 6.2 megawatt machine. So 6.2 megawatt machine. So what you can see, we don't need much wind speed to produce power. If you say you can produce power from four meter per second at the hub height. So we don't need much wind speed to produce power. So therefore, this shows that it can be really sustainable because we can produce energy even at a very modest wind speed. We don't need high wind speed to produce power. Right. Um, also, there are a few things. Uh, if we do something now, we should not leave its footprint for the next generation. So again, if you uh, if you do something uh, with wind farm, you can completely decommissioning it from the ground, so nothing will be left behind for generations to come. And that is one of the aspects of sustainability that we can give back the ground, give back the ocean floor how it was before we put the wind farm. So just to give an example, here is one of the first wind farm. And this one is only 500 kilowatt machine. So half a megawatt machine. It was built in 1992 and it was dismantled in 2016 after full design life. So what I will show you is this little video to show how we could completely decommission from the sea. So after we harness energy for its lifetime, we could completely dismantle the whole thing and give back the seafloor as it is. 
so here we'll uh, step how to decommission so what you can see here is first of all we take the top part out so the tower section out the uh, and then we gradually take even the pile out of the ground okay here's a, here's a little video <laughs> So what we have just seen that after the uh, is useful design life, it could be completely decommissioned with no issues. Now let's talk about the what's happening now. What's happening now? Most countries in in Europe they are banning petrol and diesel car from from UK uh, 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 from their fleet. And UK's plan is by 2030 there will be no petrol and diesel car. So where will the extra energy come from? We need to produce energy in, say, because these cars will be most electric car or hybrid car, electric car or hydrogen car. And where will this new energy come from? We will produce huge amount of nuclear power. The new, the new power plants can be nuclear, can be whatever, not based on fossil fuels. Or where will this come from? If you look into, if I compare the uh, sort of low carbon technology. You know, two pumping technology. One is nuclear power plant, and another is offshore wind farm. So, if you look into this whole thing, if you look into a nuclear power plant, it takes ten, at least ten years to build and commission, because it, there is a lot of certification, a lot of safety checks, a lot of planning permissions, different checks. Because these are very then can be very dangerous. On the other hand, we can build a wind farm in six to nine months. The cost to build nuclear power plant is very high; it runs in billions. But the cost to run, the cost to produce a wind farm is cheap. It's around one twentieth the cost. Decommissioning, we don't know yet what the cost of decommissioning of a nuclear power plant. 
but clearly you can see you could decommission a completely uh, complete wind farm in a matter of weeks and the costs are negligible so we're trying to put in perspective what is the potential of offshore wind farm so how can these things produce power now how is the future energy looking like now one of the more main issues is that how do we store energy because often you may have a very good wind speed but there's no demand for energy also there can be situations where you have a high demand for energy but the wind speed is not very high is not producing enough so what we need is a storage and the engineers have worked out the storage system so it can be either a battery so you store the energy in a battery and you optimize it by a grid for example is high wind uh, project uh, also known as back wind by equinor a company in norway the other option which is increasingly looking very important really, uh, and many countries are already doing it is hydrogen so what is done is you produce electricity in offshore by wind so you use green energy so you use wind blowing wind to produce electricity you use electricity to desalinate sea water and then you simply use a hydrolyzer to to electrolyze the water so you can electrolyze and you break into hydrogen oxygen the hydrogen you compress turn on a bar to reduce storage volume and that stored hydrogen can be used as an energy and this energy is equal like a lpg or lng what we use for our cooking gas or everything everything can run on hydrogen so what you can see you can use wind to produce hydrogen and that can be a cycle on its own and it is abundant it is renewable there is nothing stopping from doing it every country who has got water can produce energy so in that case we will not rely on countries to import oil so that is one of the very important points of conflict so some of the countries which produce oil are not one of the stable in terms of you know uh, politically etc etc creates all the problems now this already started so if you look in the uh, this picture it shows hydrogen power train is running in, in many places and there are plans to accelerate uh, if you uh, under the new uh, mini government they never hydrogen power yacht hydrogen powered fuel gas uh, fuel cell bus hydrogen powered hydrogen powered car so all these things are happening again on the backdrop it is the wind that can produce hydrogen and that can run economy so what i'm going to show you in the first part of the talk is that wind is a sustainable uh, solution is a possible uh, solution for net zero and it can facilitate the green hydrogen economy so next economy will be green hydrogen economy right and also what i am not covering here is that uh, nuclear power and accidents that will all link up with the cooling power and what i have shown in my some paper is that you need a stable cooling power to uh, to make uh, power plants safe in seismic areas and wind turbines can give that stable power there are also floating turbines as well so that you can harness energy from deeper water but that's for some other day and you can read some of the uh, papers in the, in the reference that can give you the idea about all the things you can read all the things in these particular references there are uh, some of the books uh, these talk in a more general way about uh, wind power and how it can help to reduce uh, the effect of climate change the second part is more engineering part and what i would like to do is try to um, you should stop important points the important point says if you look into um, offshore structures there are many offshore structures like oil and gas platforms 
but the main thing is that we cannot directly use those principles to design oxygen turbines. So that needs further thought. So this is not a structure, but it is more complex structure than an oil and gas structure, which I will cover in a minute. Second issue is offshore wind covers a large area. So therefore it will cover kilometers, like tens of kilometers, because the spacing is around a kilometer of the turbine. So, and as they cover a large area, there is change in ground profile, change in water depth. So therefore, we cannot design individual foundations individually. Because it's expensive to design each foundation individually. Therefore, we also have to use a sort of mass-produced approach to have the economy of scale. So therefore, the design is very complex because if we make as it will be as the mass produced thing, so we replicate that design the whole wind farm. So if there is omission in one foundation design, it will, it will replicate it in all the design linked at big risk. So therefore, we have to be very careful about doing the design. Uh, so this picture shows on the right hand side what's the typical spacing of turbines. So if we know the predominant wind direction. And depending on the diameter of the, of the rotor, means the blade diameter, we typically have six diameter as the spacing of turbines to avoid the wake effect. Otherwise, you will have a lower efficiency in terms of energy production. And let's look into the turbine future. We slightly outdated this, this slide because the, this slide shows the turbine from 3.6 megawatt to 8 megawatt, but we have now got 12 megawatt, 14 megawatt turbines available. So one machine can produce 14 megawatt. It's, it's a large amount of power it can, it can produce. Now, this slide, what I want to show you here is that what you can see that as the turbines get larger and larger, you can see that the tower gets longer and longer. So, if you look into eight megawatt turbine, it is 110 meter length long tower. At the top, you have got a 550 ton mass. Each blade weighs roughly 30 tons, each blade weighs. So that's why they are built offshore because you can easily bring off, you can easily bring these things offshore and put it there rather than onshore. Onshore, you can't scale it up. The onshore is very difficult to transport, carry large pieces of equipment. So the roads are not there. Roads are not ready to, to carry big stuff. Now, so effectively, it, it's, it's a tower. On the top, you have got a large mass, and you have the foundation for it. And if you look into, if you are to explain this to a child, what this structure is, is basically a flagpole uh, where you can put your flag, like a flagpole. So what you can see on the picture is a flagpole. On the top, you're putting a giant washing machine and things rotate. And on the top of that, you're trying to send some wave here. Some wave, you're passing through some wave. And the main idea is that how we design the foundation for this thing being an earthquake. That's the whole problem. Mind you, this is very different from a oil and gas structure. In oil and gas structure, which is on the right hand side, you can see it's a large rigid jacket and the top is a heavy mass. So they are very different types of structures and that makes the whole design more interesting. Okay. And uh, let's talk about the loads in a sh in, in shock. So what are the loads here? The loads are of course, the wind load is the main load. So the wind load is the wind that, that the blade, blades catch and produce power. So that is shown at the top by a wind load, which is stochastic varying, time varying load. The next big load or heavy load is a wave load. Because if you put it in C, there will be waves slamming the structure. 
that will give you some wave load on the structure. Apart from that, with a large machine, and you often have a imbalance of mass, and that gives you a one-two load. And there is also load on the tower, and that load is more three P tower, three P load. They are the loads acting on the turbine all the time. And let's look into loads for one. Uh, just look into for one minute interval. So loads. So what you can see in the top. At the hub level, you get the load from the wind. That can be a thrust, and also the imbalance of the blades. You also get wave load at the bottom part. It shows there as a dynamic wave load, and then you get a three P load in the in the tower. That's the load. And then, yeah, because we have to have it on your scales. Typically these days, yeah, you have got Wind farms about one one gigawatt. So one wind farm producing one gigawatt of power means thousand megawatt of power. So in this case, you need large area. So we are also farther away from the sea. So as you go farther away from the sea, the foundings also change. So in the shallow water, in a good sea condition, you'll put a gravity base. Then as you go deeper and Deeper, you start to put a monobile, means a one large diameter pile. Then you put suction caissons. You then move it on to tripod or jacket on pile. Sixty meter or more, you start to go on to floating system. And here is a, a figure showing the uh, water depth in some in some places. Where the water depth is more than hundred meters, you will only go for a floating system. So here is the currently the types of structure being used, and you can see with water depth as water the water depth increases, you start to go from gravity based to floating. You can read all the design parts uh, in this book uh, uh, published two years ago. Um, giving quite a, a bit of bit of details about the design and the and the different parts. What are the issues? What I am picking up here are the important points that are related to seismic design. So in, one important part is serviceability uh, um, requirement for design, meaning these are typically designed for thirty years. So what we do, we got to predict the amount of tilt if it tilts over the lifetime. So in a seismic area, if the ground is liquefiable, there can be a tilt in the whole design. And how do you predict the tilt? And what do we do that we have the tilt to a desired limit? So if you see here, there's some thing called uh, limit of warranty, which is theta uh, uh, limit. That means uh, warranty is lost if that is if that is breached. So typically, they are 0 0.5 degree, 0 0.75 degree is the amount of tilt allowed after an earthquake or in, under any condition. Now the reasons are different because if, it, if the wind turbine tilts, there can be quite a bit of a bit of a problem. And I'm not going to details here. One important part is the higher P delta effect. There can be bearing issues, the bearing uh, wear and tear, etc. For cyclic, what the important part is the iron acceleration. Because, because during earthquake, one thing we must not get is the top thing, the top machine accelerates more than 0.2 G to 0.4 G. So there, there is still a discussion about uh, what, the, what the amount is. Typically, 0.2 G to 0.4 G. Is acceleration that can be allowed at the, at the top. So you have to make sure that that the you know, adequate stiffness, or however however we do the design, that the access is not breached. Also, due to liquefaction, there can be some tilting. So in terms of overall design considerations, there are quite a few. One is the ultimate limit state, serviceability limit state, modes of vibration. 
fitting the mistake and think out how can you install, how can you remove robustness and decline. Now I'll touch on now. Uh, there are two minutes are remaining. How many? Uh, two minutes. Okay. So the main things are we are building around the um, wind farm there. There are quite a bit of issues there to do with uh, fault movement, shaking, liquefaction, and this can lo lead to various things. And the risk increase as the earthquake intensity goes uh, higher. Now there can be tsunami as well. If the earthquake is more than 7.5 in some, some situations. And so as a designer, one has to go through all the different steps to make sure that the RNS is not exceeded and it, it doesn't feel zero point, more than 0 0.5 or 0 0.75 degrees. And here are the different stages. And they're put on here. So one important part is how do you combine the effect of wind, wave, and earthquake? So we have to do a standard analysis to find out what happened to the ground. We have to put py curves, but make sure that the py curves comply with the, with the requirement, meaning you must have a zero resistance at the top, at, at the uh, at small amounts of y. So that, that's the py curve for liquefiable soil, it must be used. You can read about in this particular book, which I authored a couple of years ago. For floating system, you got to find out the fault rupture. So again, you have to understand how much a fault uh, rupture can induce movement in the whole system. And we can do the analysis based on that and provide adequate uh, safety cues and other things. Again, uh, we have some analysis of the, of the uh, tension leg platform, giving a ground motion to see how it behaves. And that's for tension leg platform analysis. So to conclude, offshore wind turbines are important component of uh, free energy, energy systems. So we have to look into these systems more carefully. SLS criteria dominate the design. The important steps are assessment of seismic hazard at a given site, selection of strong motion, then load combination criteria considering wind, wave earthquake, and the control system design. So I will finish now and I'm happy to pass back to the uh, Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Subhamoy, for a very uh, interesting and informative lecture. So now I request Dr. Vikas Kumar to take up the question, if any. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, there are uh, one question, sir. Uh, that is asked from Professor B.K. Maheshwari. Uh, the question is that, uh, can the component uh, monopiles and the cables from wing commissions can be reused for nest wind turbine? Ah. Um, so the pile, so the pile will undergo a lot of corrosion damage because the, the piles are, the piles are actually put in the ground. So there will be a lot of uh, you know, corrosion damage and fatigue damage. So it cannot be directly used because you will lose the all its life. But however, they can be again recycled. So you can again melt it and again reuse it. And that's the whole whole purpose. So we try to reuse, recycle, reduce the waste. So that, that's the whole purpose to use that. And again, in terms of offshore cables, there will be copper cables, copper wire, etc. Et again, uh, is of course we can recycle them uh, after you know the, so the main aim is now to not do more, more mining but keep on recycling reusing and make uh, better use of the resource we have already got. Uh, I think uh, I just asked one more question, sir. Uh, you okay. just explain all the things uh, related to the offshore wind turbines uh, regarding sustainable energy, then how we can design the uh, grounded system and uh, floating system. And then how, what are the components that are to be considered for the liquefaction also. My point, uh, my question is that, sir, can, uh, um, uh, which type of technology can be used uh, 
uh, about monopiles and the jacket technology for the wind turbine open turbine system yeah so so um, basically uh, uh, each country is uh, different right so what we need is a is a monopile uh, monopile is easy to fabricate because what you need is a steel plate and you simply you take a steel plate and simply turn it over and you weld it there right and you, and you sort of and you and you weld it right and you can get a get a monopile right now in certain countries where labor is expensive they would go for automated monopile because you don't need much labor labor is expensive and things are cheap but in certain certain countries where the labor is cheap but things are expensive to buy the material in that case they will they might go for a jacket foundry so jacket they have a small diameter pile so if you look into monopile they are now 8 meter diameter 10 meter diameter large large monopile so you need a vessel equipment uh, the vessel to install they may need to be large many countries will not have those vessels because offshore industry is very niche uh, niche industry niche market you need the expertise to do these large things now often we not have those things those countries will find it easier and cheaper to use small diameter pile like typically the diameter will be 1.5 meter 2 meter 1.5 meter you have a jacket and this can be installed by small contractors they available there the overall cost will be low so what you want to look into your own supply chain so who will do all the things for us if you say okay fine there are only few people can do it from europe you got to wait for many many years to, for them to come and do it they we don't don't have vessel so the answer is again economics so we want to produce power let's see what system so basically the main aim is to put the big turbine on the top of the tower because the turbine will tell you that the hub height has to be 110 meter so you must have a 110 meter tower now what foundation i would need let's see what gives us the cheapest price because we 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 don't want to you know go for monopile because other country are doing it so they are doing it for their own economy so that works for them a country like india where you have labor is less expensive you can look into your own supply chain your own foundation and that's why there is a lot of scope for innovation so if you look into innovation going on in this industry in japan in china in korea in taiwan they trying to innovate new foundations new things because though the wind industry started in europe but now they are spreading worldwide and each wants to adapt based on their own supply chain their strength so what is strength of the country you know what what can i get you know why do i have to copy that technology what we need is a foundation the foundation must carry this load so we can start from bottom up and build yeah thank you, thank you sir Uh, yeah is there any effect on environment uh, if we consider say so many wind turbines installed in the sea so is there any interaction effects uh, of this uh, tur- installing turbines well the interaction effects can, can be the bird flying so yeah. o- often you will see in in some some part there are migratory migratory birds the might the birds migrate from far off country right so what happens the as the birds fly they often fly very close to the close to the um, water surface so very close to the water level of the sea so often in certain countries when they do environmental check they say must have a height so the blades must have a minimum gap because the birds can fly under birds can fly and the blood bird may not see the, the blades turning and hitting them so you have you know people have fun that and anyway look the main thing is that you are not burning any fossil fuel you are not burning oil and gas or coal you know and it is not a nuclear right people often care about nuclear power plants close to their home you know what will happen you know, nobody knows so this is one of the good solution you know and this is being used for ages <clears throat> okay yeah thank you thank you sir uh, yeah. any other uh, question 
I think there's no more question, no? 